Okay, folks, the recording has begun. We are here on unfound on the ground number five. Prioritizing accuracy and navigating controversy for missing persons cases, which of course operates under the unfound framework. The flagship is the episodes, are the episodes, um, of course, and everything that goes with it, but the unfound brand, of course, always from a tech standpoint, if something happens, if I disappear digital, digitally, keep talking. I have the dial-ins in front of me. Of course, I would try to log back in. We know how technology happens. And so I would be back as best as I can shortly. So stay on the ship if I disappear. Uh, let me go through the usual overview, please. That's important. And of course, this is prioritizing accuracy and navigating controversy for missing persons cases. Unfound on the ground number five. We are recording audio only. Of course, you can join video if you want, uh, but audio is, is only being recorded. Chat is disabled for the journalistic, promotional, and or commercial purposes of Unfound. The audio recording of this digital meeting will be distributed by Unfound. By participating in this digital meeting, you agree to give unfound permission to use the audio recording of your words for journalistic, promotional, and or commercial purposes with no compensation to you from unfound, its assistants, its affiliates, its partners, etc. Thank you again, folks, for joining us. In particular, we want to, as an ongoing basis, be thankful for, to, our think tank members who have participated in and helped shape this. And of course, I've mentioned this in, in my email updates. The, the things we discuss here, the things you share with, with me or Ed or other team members, we're constantly considering it in a way it's consistently informing what we do. Um, previous episodes are available up through number four and you can find those Natasha, those are posted all on the YouTube channel in a special section, correct? Yes, the playlist is uh, unfound on the ground, and then you also see uh, recent uploads, the recent upload area. Outstanding. So again, if, if you're wanting to find those, um, they're out there. I would ask you to also share those. Uh, share those, share those. Obviously, this is a great way to to get people interested in what we're doing. I wanna also, of course, again, mention the unfoundpodcast.com, the unfoundpodcast.com. And again, that is the website for everything unfound. Uh, also, in addition, let me remind you, and yes, we are, and, and again, finally, and again, my lack, not Natasha's, updating the data gems page which is a great resource. Let me remind you when you are on the unfoundpodcast.com, if you go on the top of the screen, the um, menu bar, whatever you call it at the top, click on episodes, a drop down box will appear, and then go to on the ground, another box will appear to the left, and just click on data gems, right? And that is the ongoing list of resources that are things that we discuss that can be resources as well as citations. So we're just keeping one major page uh, for everything. That is a great resource page. I would encourage folks to share it also. I know that I have at least, at least to one person beyond this group, beyond even the sort of unfound groups uh, when I talk about Unfound and talk a little bit about what we're doing, um, that is a public evidence resources. It's just a great resource list. So that's something you might want to utilize and share. So um, that's something that's important. The Unfound Data Gems page. And again, thanks to Natasha for that. Again, I'm Eric Rabowski. And um, beyond my teaching, and study of human communication in academia. 
I do cold case journalism. I've been a guest on Unfound. I'm part of the assisting team, uh, a minimally contributing part to a great team. Again, my comments, words, et cetera, tonight do not necessarily reflect my employing institution of higher learning. And of course, you are always free to provide any of your own disclaimers. And as always, like I say, although we strive here to reflect the unfound brand, um, we're not always necessarily uh, speaking in every way, shape or form for Ed, um, although we certainly are wanting to reflect what the unfound brand does. Before we are to sort of transition tonight, um, as I was thinking through some things, um, I want to read a, an excerpt from Ed and the blog, the blog. And this was the, uh, in April from uh, the blog from the Unfound podcast. Let me just say this so please trust me when I say that the world we live in is safer than it ever has been since the 1950s. That doesn't mean bad things won't happen. It doesn't mean it will continue to be this way. All it means is this is how it is right now. Unfortunately, what I'm also saying is I don't believe our nature has changed. I do not believe that we are inherently nicer or more peaceful humans than 50 years. Nothing I've seen tells me that. I mean, all you have to do is read any comment section for virtually any online article out there and it eventually descends into people making threats against each other and so forth. Obviously, and if you read, you know, the rest of that blog and you do some of your own reflection, the discussion about human nature can get into all sorts of areas about crime and justice, but particularly pressing is how unfortunately uh, human beings are sloppy with accuracy at times, not this group, and don't engage controversy with diligence, civility, ethics, and, well, competence, or at least strive for a basic degree of competence. Of course, the internet is particularly problematic, but it's not only the internet, folks. So I thought those comments from, from Ed from the blog were particularly important reflection for us tonight. Um, as we think about prioritizing accuracy and navigating controversy. Again, we're talking about things that, okay, could be journalistic, professional, citizen journalism, certainly raising awareness, being involved in advocacy, even as we, we are audiences of various media outlets, whether we're doing intensive research or we're simply engaging in our own media, watching, listening, reading, etc. So we want to be better audience members. When we're thinking about accuracy, again, some of what, I just like to review certain things. And again, it was Delane in some episodes this, that started that conversation about staying organized and you know, that's, that's always, I know I need to get more organized and not, as I said before, I'm not the most disorganized, but I'm not the most organized either. Uh, but, you know, there is a way in which staying organized, however you choose to do that digitally or the old fashioned way and papers and files or both can help us be accurate. Again, I want to credit, like I said, in the email, the un Ed and the unfound team, of course, in shaping the direction of this episode, questions, ideas, uh, for sure. Um, the idea of accuracy, and this is something when Ed and I were communicating, right? It's always important, right? Always important. It's a timeless concept, a timeless set of practices, right? We always want to be striving for accuracy, and that's something that's important for both effective and ethical, right, engagement in missing persons cases. Obviously there are things in episodes one, two, three, and four that we discussed that provide a great backdrop for us as we think more deeply about accuracy uh, across and, and controversy or not. We're interested in justice. Again, back to some of my communication with, with Ed. Unfound is not a 
law enforcement agency, uh, but engaging, you know, as an outlet, as a program, uh, you know, doing missing persons work. I would call it missing persons journalism. I'm not going to speak for Ed on that one. Um, but there is a sense of how the contribution to justice and this accuracy component is important, right? We're dealing with information. We're dealing with ideas. We're dealing in the, sometimes in, with unfound uh, effective and ethical argumentation, prioritizing evidence, right? Facts, grounding our analysis as best as possible along those lines for sure. And of course, the usual disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm not a lawyer. And so these are things to keep in mind. And I am going to start because I like to, as you know, dive into a question right away. And the first question we had, of course, was how do we ascertain the credibility of media outlets for accuracy? And here we're, we're, you know, there's television, there's newspaper, magazines, podcasts, right, and so forth, radio programs, radio programs, old fashioned, right, turn on the radio. So how do we ascertain credibility? I have some thoughts, but I'm going to start, as always, with the group. Tanya, I'm starting with you. How do we ascertain credibility of media outlets for accuracy? How do we weigh that? You can pass if you want, but I'm, go ahead. I just, uh, just what, what I um, jotted down and thought of was just to double um, check them with other uh, media outlets, compare them, see what's coming up consistently with all of them, all the different messages um, that are consistent. And then the messages that are not consistent, things that are um, being said that are different from one, um, one, I guess, you know, uh, article or, or post or anything that's different from another. And I would say those things would, would stand out. And then also to, um, check on the actual, the program itself, the host, any emails or, um, web addresses, anything that are associated with that and look into those and see what just what kinds of things might come up about those specific items on the internet, whether good, bad, and see what anyone else might be saying about, um, you know, things that they're seeing that that aren't actually factual. Um, and that's just one of that's just something that I had that popped up for me. Yeah, that's helpful. Comparing sources ourselves, seeing to what extent people out there, when we're seeing what they're doing, to what extent and how deep, how wide and how deep are they dealing with sources, uh, are dealing with their own credibility, what's the credibility of their sources, where are they at in the mix? I think that's great. Kathy, how about you? How do we weigh or ascertain the credibility of these media outlets for accuracy? Uh, a lot of her ideas were mine as well. And you just said, for me, probably almost number one is credibility. Uh, if you know anything about the news source, reputation, your experience, other people's reputations uh, who have had experience with this news source, how credible, what kind of information is being disseminated? Yeah. Uh, you're going to treat different pieces of information differently like an eyewitness account. Well, so many of those aren't very credible. So you have to kind of take these little pieces of information and decide kind of how you're going to treat it. Compare, contrast, uh, has this news source been accurate? Often, you know, it, it kind of just depends. Um, I think that's mostly what I was going to say. On this. Yeah, and it takes work, doesn't it? it you know, really, if we're oh, going to be... Ab 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 absolutely. And you have to, I personally, I am a huge, accuracy means everything to me. I'm accurate, try to be accurate about everything. And some people are real sloppy. And so I just, that's a kind of a pet peeve of mine. Accurate, accurate, if you can determine it. And I think for this question, I think that I won't keep going on and on. So thank you. <laughs> No, no, that's very helpful, though. It takes hard work. 
Michelle, do you want to contribute? Or again, you can pass, but you can, any thoughts on this in terms of ascertaining the credibility of media outlets for accuracy? Okay, we can always come back if you're not, but that's okay. Paula, how about you? Anything you'd like to add to this, right? Weighing the credibility of media outlets. Well, I think you have to be By really the way, careful. Sorry, I didn't realize I had oh. to unmute myself. Sorry, go ahead. But okay. I apologize. I didn't realize that. No, but go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you, you go for Okay, it? Michelle, we'll come and back. I apologize. To, yep, Michelle, we'll come back to you. Paula, okay. go ahead, and then we'll come back go to ahead, Michelle. Paula. Paula, go ahead. Okay, I think we just have to be really careful because um, there's a big difference between a news outlet and um, entertainment. Yes. And I think we have to really vet those sources that we come to trust, whether they are truly a news source or more of an entertainment source. It's a great point. And, and the difficulty is here, and, and there are a number of sources I could cite on this, as a communication professor, right? So we have, and we all know this from our landscape, right? We have news, we have the spectrum of opinion programming, and of course we have entertainment. And of course there can be crossover sometimes. Um, and then over the decades, as, as, as the uh, business and the technology of media has expanded, right? We have, you know, cable programming, internet, radio, satellite radio, right? We're sort of absorbed by messages. And, and so sorting through that can be very difficult. Of course, this group, and, and we have a niche or set of niche areas that we're interested in. So that gives us some, some focus to navigate that, but it's still very difficult. All right? And even on sort of crime issues, right? So much of what folks think about that in some way <laughs> can be shaped by things that have a sort of entertainment side to that. Um, but yeah, it, and again, it takes the hard work to get through that, doesn't it, Paula? So that was helpful. Michelle, we're coming back to you now. Anything you'd like to contribute to this? Um, just as far as, I mean, I don't know how much time you would have, I'm talking about when, but to, to research any particular outlet but maybe just again the, the same theme is doing your homework looking at credibility um i look at sometimes the blogs and um they'll have a case of someone missing and then it's all you know sometimes people don't want to say the the bad things about the, the person so they won't you know s tell uh, an outlet everything so just being careful about um, what you put out and, and into um on the media but i think the main thing is doing homework and just seeing which outlet if you think you can trust it like some people think they can trust cnn some people don't think they can i'm just using it as an example sure. so just seeing what's trusted i mean sometimes you, you and you want that you want to go to cnn and, and fox because those they cover a wide area so i think it's even with a blog i mean a, a podcast listen to the podcast a couple of episodes ahead of time to see how they do it they're just reading newspapers yeah, the concept of doing your homework, Michelle, is very important. For sure. Very good. That's helpful. Do your homework. And again, regardless, just to use politics as an example, whatever your political view, right? Don't, you know, study it on your own. Whether you're watching CNN or Fox or MSNBC or C-SPAN, do more research. Do more homework. Same thing with our, our, obviously what we're doing requires that out of necessity because accuracy is so important. Natasha, how about you? What would you add to this conversation? How do we ascertain or weigh these media outlets? Um, I can certainly speak for the news outlets. So for example, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, they have uh, news uh, bureaus and then bureau chiefs and editorial meetings every day and then of course front and center is uh, what is the credibility uh -huh. uh, as far as ap and reuters ap is more national and reuters is, an, is international so i would consider those the gold standard and then of course uh, the local news um, should follow suit uh, and then also just look at how they handle retractions i mean uh, no one's per 
people are not perfect, the coverage isn't perfect, but then how did they issue retractions? So I would consider those uh, highly credible. But then as far as what we're doing with, un with Unfound, uh, I think it's really fascinating how, for example, Google Earth is used. So what was the garage like, uh, you know, recently versus two years ago? Was there a change? Um, I find that really useful as well. Yeah, that is interesting. And, and of course, understand it. I mean, you mentioned some really important things about understanding even how the, the news business works. Uh, even, his, even historically, the opinion side of media and how, um, how publications will differentiate, right, in terms of how space and, well, now digital space is used, but then sometimes there are some you know, some, some ways in which that crosses over. Of course, even good analysis needs to be grounded in, in facts. And yeah, using these tools and I, and the point about retractions too, how do they, how do they deal with retractions? So again, this is going back to doing our homework, right? Because to, to ascertain these sorts of things, right? We would have to um, take the time to, um, We'll find some of those things out and do our own research. That's very helpful. And that is a great lead in to our second one. Well, and, and let me mention some things. And I have a source, of course, this will be on the, the data gems. Let me mention some things. I'll make sure that this gets, some of you may have heard of the OWL, the OWL, owl.purdue.edu. And again, we'll make sure that there are specific um, links on the data gems. Of course, this is a site for that, that, that's geared toward um, students, particularly undergraduate students, but not necessarily. And I think people in general can value from this. It's a writing lab at Purdue. It's a very popular website. It's consulted a lot. And so whether it's digital, obviously tonight we are thinking about digital sources, but some of this pertains to, you know, sources in general, you know, and so, and I know we have a later question about the internet. So in some ways, some of this is a preliminary and none of this is a guarantee for accuracy, of course, but as we do our homework and we think through, you know, these sources and weighing their credibility, we have to keep in mind that, um, you know, why some of these, these entities are doing what they're doing. Of course, in the American context, right? a large majority of our media, at least in the United States, operates as a business, not all of it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad or untrue, right? That is what it is. In fact, you could argue, I guess, that there's provides uh, checks and balances in there economically. But regardless, right, we have a responsibility. So for instance, you know, like some of us have mentioned, um, what do we know about the author? What do we know about their qualifications? Of course, we have to be careful because there are times when someone who is not necessarily a professional, but, but someone who's a really good amateur uh, discovers something groundbreaking. That's usually something that can be discovered or seen though from the reader. Um, you know, how are they navigating fact and opinion, right? Um, is their analysis or opinion based on fact? Do they make it clear? Um, when they are um, talking in that mode, for instance, um, do they cite their sources well? Do they cite sources, right? Obviously, one of the things to be on the lookout for, especially on the internet, but not necessarily, is some sort of plagiarism, right? That could be a red flag. Obviously, on the internet, that's not as hard to detect as some people think. Um, some of the discussion on the OWL pertains, you know, what we've discussed in, in previous episodes, but uh, particularly for digital sources, um, you know, look at the domain. Now, nowadays, as, as many of the domain types, .com, .gov, .org, et cetera, can be obtained by anyone. There are exceptions, right? Um, as far as I know, to this point, only government entities can get a .gov and only educational institutes can get a .edu. Um, you know, in the past, right, if they, you know, dot .org, um, you know, really nowadays, almost anyone can, can get a dot .org. 
but looking at the domain extension again not a not a um not a, a guarantee but that can give you some insight into the angle uh again just because it's dot com which tends to be commercial doesn't mean it's not credible but depending on the perspective they're talking about that might give you some insight how about the use of wikipedia right now there's a lot of true things on wikipedia but you know as as i tell my students it doesn't necessarily have adequate editorial review um in, in certain ways to be considered credible for every discussion it can be a starting point it can be a place to look um, as the owl said and i've said in the past it could be a springboard right it provides references you can kind of see what's going on um, obviously you know that's 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 a place but if you run into you know a blog for instance that's only citing wikipedia for instance Right? Not that citing it per se is bad, but if they're only relying on that and not following some of the sources themselves, well, that could be a problem. One thing that they mention here, and this is relevant to what we're talking about tonight, is clickbait, right? The issue of clickbait. And so in the internet world, obviously, there's a lot of monetization going on and, and trying to drive traffic. And so whether we see advertisements or headlines, uh, let's say style over substance might be one way of thinking about it. It's trying to draw us in in some way and we might be really interested in what we're seeing and then all of a sudden we're pulled into something that's not very substantive, particularly with regard to accuracy. Natasha, you're more of an internet expert than I. Can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts on clickbait? Sure. Um, it's probably going to be the opposite of what you're thinking. Uh, I had actually worked in uh, digital positions, and it's just important to know that the people that work at Facebook or, you know, really anywhere, or uh, the New York Times, it isn't free. Um, they have to pay for the salaries, they have to pay for a bunch of things. So I think in general, uh, they're trying to do as best as they can, um, not only to provide the best possible product, but also to pay, uh, the bills and, and to hire the best talent. So it is highly competitive, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's a world of digital research, which is what I was doing. So uh, we would test creative to see which uh, would be more likely to be clickable, you know, and then not only that, but you remember the brand, you remember the messaging, how likely are you to purchase the product, um, things of that nature. So there's, there's an entire world and industry out there uh, as well, just uh, to throw that out there. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't want, and I don't, and I'm not completely disagreeing here with Natasha. I realize and support that entities need to monetize, need to pay people, and that is important. And I think there is a way where you can effectively and ethically have a great headline, uh, get people to click it, and have a well-researched story or a well-argued opinion piece, right? And so I do not want to seem like I'm anti-market here. Uh, but it does, I think, readers and listeners and viewers have a responsibility to, to navigate the ethical or unethical or you know whatever we want to call it use of of clickbait is that a good middle ground natasha sure um i just think that for a quality product whatever that is a, a quality digital product um click it would not even come as, as a conversation starter i think people would try to stick to steer clear from clickbait yep great and this is a related thing too and it's mentioned on the owl and certainly natasha has pointed to this is that search engine optimization or SEO, right, is part of the internet world. People are competing um, with, with trying to get as best as they can on search. And uh, there, are, there are ways of doing that that are uh, proper and there are ways of doing that that are improper. Um, and that's going to impact what we see. But regardless, when we are doing research, whether we're researching things ourselves or we're researching these media entities is that, you know, keep going, keep going, keep going on what you click on and keep going down the line, right? Whether that's on Google or YouTube, which of course is tied to Google or Bing or 
whatever search capacity you're using, keep going, right? Because although there might be something really relevant on that first section of the page or the first page, but that doesn't mean it's, it's the only thing you ought to be looking at. So I could go on and on here, but these are some things we ought to be thinking about when we're either evaluating sources or working through the finding of sources. Another thing I wanna to mention too is, again, this is a reminder of something I said before in episode four, when you are, um, for the second question, because some of this is, is a carryover, um, when we're thinking about human sources and documents and now the, the programs, when we're watching it and when we're doing it, when we're doing it too, watch out for those spelling variations, right? If we're researching a case, either as, a, as an audience person or as a journalist or whatever, right? Remember, let's stay organized. Watch out for those spelling or uh, sometimes things are misspelled. Some things, things have multiple uh, variations in spelling, right? Track those things. That was something I mentioned before that's important as you're going through uh, this or that case or, or researching uh, through old media reports because there are times when spelling is very. So I'm just going to keep going here and I have a case study coming up that's going to highlight some of our, our questions here, right? And con considering what we have discussed to this point in these episodes, human sources, documents, Right. If you were doing awareness or you were doing journalism or you were doing a blog, which some of you have done um, or whatever, if you're out there advocating in the community, you were trying to raise awareness vocally. Right. How much how might one best strive for accuracy if you were the communicator? Now, some of this is uh, reinforces the listening part. I know that. But there are some distinctions. And I have a case study for us to start discussing. But let me go back to Tanya on this. Um, Tanya, is if you were out there doing some advocacy, anything you want to add, right, in terms of striving for accuracy from the communicator's point of view or the researcher's point of view to the public? Um, just double checking and triple checking all the information that I already have yeah. together making sure, like you said, everything is accurate, names are spelled right, cities, last place they were seen. Um, but uh, other than that, no, I don't. Yeah, and you've reminded me of something I neglected to mention. When we're doing our own research and we're looking for those spelling variations, whether it was a misspelling or just the legitimate variations of how names are spelled differently for different reasons over the years, and then if we are in a situation where we are communicating that out, whether we're a guest on Ed's program or we're a, a blogger on our own or we're tweeting or we're talking, we got to remember other people are picking up on that too, right? So be accurate. And even when there are variations, be clear about that in your explanations. Kathy, anything you'd like to add in terms of the commuter cater side of this, if you were out there doing that? Not too, not, not really, uh, other than what Tanya was saying, but the, the spelling is just so important because, like you were saying, Eric, that so often sources will pick up different uh, spellings of things, and you can't narrow and limit your searches of things and trying to gain information if you don't look at all these different possibilities, maybe different locations, yeah. just be careful about narrowing things too much. Yeah. I know my little sister has been doing some family research here in the past few years, and we found this, it's kind of a, boy, it can be really puzzling, an enigma. Uh, what's going on? Why can't we find, you know, we've, we've pointed out this and this and this, but why isn't it this other puzzle piece fitting? So just be careful about where you narrow and be careful about what you believe. I have some friends who believe everything they read, or maybe I'm jumping ahead, but on the internet. So you want to be really, really careful that take a position like I would take skeptical. Don't believe it until you think it's, you know, absolutely accurate. Yeah. And Kathy, you remind me of something else that even goes beyond name spellings. As I've mentioned in this, this important forum before, my main hobby is amateur genealogy. I'm not going to mention any specifics here, but let me tell you this. 
for missing persons cases, which sometimes genealogical profiles are needed, and for your own genealogy. When you're on places like Ancestry.com and elsewhere, and again, I'm not criticizing Ancestry.com, it, it is what it is, but people will post and, and they'll come up and search uh, their own family trees, and then they put it public, they put it private. Some of you may have seen that. Uh, and, and I'm extensively knowledgeable about my own family, at least segments of it, you know, of it. I have a lot more research to do. And I find on there people will just have inaccurate things, even on things that are pertaining to, you know, people that are married to third cousins, things that I'm pretty knowledgeable about, or even people that were you know, second, first cousins, great aunts, great uncles, and so forth in their families. And part of it is, is because again, like we've talked about before, people replicate they, they, things that they've found, or they make inferences that are not a adequately grounded, etc. And I probably don't do enough of this, uh, but I've thought about reaching out to those folks and just, you know, through the communication saying, hey, you know, you might want to rethink this. And uh, I'm not saying anyone's being, you know, doing anything intentionally wrong or whatever, but, or immoral, but yeah, inaccuracy, right, it's, it's, it's a problem. And so, yeah, it's important to be focused and to be specific, but not to narrow too quickly. That is a very, very important thought um, for research and, of course, communicating that research. Michelle, is there anything you'd like to add to this? I don't have anything. Okay, Paula, how Thank about you? you? No, I'm good. Okay, Natasha, now, uh, Natasha, I'm not putting you on the spot, but I'm crediting you. This question in part was, you know, a part of our ongoing communication in the lead up here. You had some thoughts about timing and, and about interviewing and putting that together and, and, and the mindset that journalists ought to bring to this. So in terms of, of striving for accuracy, anything you'd like to add? Oh, sure. Um, one of the hobbies that I have is to listen to true crime podcasts and then um, share with the Unfound team some best practices. So I would encourage everybody to do the same. I mean, it really isn't worth the time to um, discuss them all here, but there are prize winning uh, podcasters and podcast shows. Uh, so maybe to look at the technique and the method of what they're doing and see how you can apply it to your investigation, uh, of course, as well as unfound <laughs> and what we're doing here, like I was about saying. Sure. Any specific best practices you'd like to share? Well, uh, there are podcasts where the entire season is full of episodes and those episodes are all dealing with one particular case. So that would be a deep dive, a deep focus into the case. And uh, it really is quite interesting uh, how credibility just bubbles to the surface when you're talking to uh, the person of interest, for example, mm -hmm. and what that did to the person to be called a person of interest and how that affected his or her life. Um, talking to the sheriff, uh, people in the know. It's uh, really, it can be really uh, fascinating, intri intriguing, and then also, of course, highly credible when you're talking to the major players of the investigation. Yeah, and the other thing I'll mention, and we won't mention any specific uh, podcasts or whatever, but so let's just keep it general. And you mentioned this, and I thought about this more. Um, the difference between a journalist who's seeking clicks or sensationalism without ethically accounting for the people, the information versus someone who really takes the time, right? This, this, that timing element. Someone who's really in it for themselves only versus truly getting interested in the case and the public good and, and of course, uh, trying to help the case forward, right? Yeah, and you can hear the sincerity in, in the voice of the, of the journalist. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm constantly focusing on this idea of being effective and ethical. I think I get everyone on this one. So this is great. So I want to direct everyone. And uh, if you've listened to it already, great. If you haven't, I would suggest it uh, from May. Um, Julianne Wefflin case, of course, Ed did that in May. And by the way, I didn't, uh, well, I don't know when today or yesterday, today I realized this, but that may have been, that was one of the early uh, announcements of this great endeavor, unfound on the ground. But um, the uh, Wefflin case ultimately turns out to be a podcast episode that ultimately deals with, um, you know, three disappearances and three, uh, you know, as usual, Ed has the references on the Potomatic site. And I'm sure Natasha, that one's, is that one on YouTube to remind me? Yes, of course. Yeah. So that's on YouTube too. And so it's uh, Julie Wefflin and Deborah Jean Swanson. And uh, well, depending on, as the Charlie project says, you know, let's just say Catherine Gregory is some agency's report. So, Okay, so this case has um, is relevant, you know, to our interest tonight in terms of accuracy or striving for accuracy, as well as navigating controversy well. And and even in that episode, right, Ed suggests, right, in terms of um, the uh, guest, John Polos. Polos, I may be mispronouncing, but um, to listen to that episode, right, because of the um, focus and effort that uh, the guest brings to, in a way, making his case about the case or about these cases. Um, I, I, so this was my, uh, you know, this, again, the Unfound team jostled around some ideas. So this was one of the ones that, that Ed thought to take a look at. And for good reason. If you listen to that case, that podcast, and, and again, I would encourage you to do it. It's kind of, it was kind of inspiring to me. Um, I had not had a chance to, to listen to this one. And, uh, you know, I always think, you know, and we all have our own schedules. We all have what we're, what we're doing. But it was kind of inspiring, uh, the depth and breadth that the case was covered. We talk about accuracy, right? Striving for accuracy, being clear as best as possible about what's known and unknown. Sort of the analysis in the, the episode. Also the, the guest going through even how he is collaborating. Again, this is a, a key theme for us. And you know, accuracy is one of the aims that that we're, we're that's important for us in, in terms of collaboration and so forth, right? I would encourage, and the other thing is, and, and the guest talked about too, and, and Ed and the guest, you know, toward the middle, toward the end of that, and it's it's about two and a half hours, that, that podcast episode. Um, even how being on there, right, is all obviously publicizing the case, particularly in the region, right, in that Pacific Northwest region. Uh, of course, we've talked, I mean, we're going back to our own themes of raising awareness, but hey, if you're going to raise awareness, raise awareness in a way that's really being an example or being exemplary with regard to accuracy and analysis and, and argumentation. If you listen to the summation, right, as usual, Ed's going to be thorough, but this is a really good example of this, right, in terms of... Um, you know, Ed uh, going through sort of the one way or another way to think about the case that the guest made, uh, ultimately in some ways e expressing disagreement about the idea or the possibility of uh, a gentleman named Will Park. So let me say allegedly, allegedly, allegedly being the person who was responsible for one, two, or three of these disappearances, um, just so I get a sense of who knows what. And if, if your answer is no, that's okay. Tanya, have you listened to this case? Yeah, that was the 
was the last one no it was the one before the last right the this was in may yes. this was in may jolie weflin the mm -hmm. women's region I've, I've listened to i've listened to all of them um trying to think of exactly which one that is but i have listened yes okay and, and i'm going to mention some blog posts that that the team that ed and the team have up too so you are familiar with it at least kathy are you familiar with this case Absolutely, Eric. Uh, do you concur? Is there anything you'd like to add about how this is a real great example, including the guests, not just Ed, Ed and the guests, of the sorts of striving for accuracy that we're talking about? I think it's a great example because it's not, you've got this guy who did all this research, which is wonderful, but, and he's kind of fingering this one guy, looks suspicious, but Will Parks, but also the way Ed did it, we take a step back and look, well, maybe he's not, has nothing to do with it. Yeah. So you really have to open your mind and look at all the different, especially with Julia Wefflin. The others we didn't have quite as much, well, like Catherine Gregory didn't, uh, that was just, she lived, as I recall, lived kind of close, you know, within a few miles of where he lived at the time or whatever. But um, for Julie Wefflin, all the little little details of this disappearance and where she that substation she was working at and if you parked a car it would be obvious if you look on the google earth or a map or whatever you know you really have to put the things together as to how this person accomplished this you know yeah. someone took her but was it like an employee who came and said hey julie how you doing et cetera, et cetera, and then turned out to be a bad guy or, and the security at the time wasn't as good as it is now. So it's really an excellent example of watch that you don't just jump to a conclusion that, oh, Will Parks is probably guilty, or yeah. there was a sighting of a little kid uh, uh, riding his bike, a few kid teenagers riding their bikes, and how credible was his sighting? Maybe that's not credible at all. So yeah. you really got to weigh all these different facts and it just, the location, how the person drove by there, everything. It's really, that's a very, something where there's a lot of different possibilities as to how she was abducted and who did it. Absolutely. And the, and the, and the thing that's helpful to complement what you're saying is when Ed's doing the analysis towards the end, right? Uh, notwithstanding the quality, he says, and I'm paraphrasing, Right. Notwithstanding the great work and the quality of the research of the guest, one can still have reservations about where the guest is going. And that's OK, because if you're in the context of the detail and it's kind of goes back to what you said earlier, watching how you're narrowing. Right. Don't jump to conclusions. Look at the possibilities. Take the step back. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is it. Right. Again, using our analytical, some would say critical thinking abilities. Absolutely. Michelle, are you familiar with this case? Yes, I did hear the, um, the uh, episode, yes. Any thoughts on how this relates to what we're discussing? What was the question again, Bob? Uh, any thoughts on how this relates to what we're discussing, the Wefflin uh, podcast? No, I don't have anything, but yes, I am familiar with it. Okay, thank you. Paula, <laughs> any thoughts on, are you familiar with this case, Paula? Yes, I am. Um, I think as accurate as um, this guy dug into the case and could tell where he had put flyers and his radius around and all of that, it just goes to show even with him being very accurate with what he had done and what he had found out, there's always a different conclusion or it can be drawn at the Absolutely. end. There's always a different conclusion. But I mean, as far as his documentation and he kept the notes and I mean, it's helpful, but in the end, we really, it doesn't, it didn't, it didn't necessarily lead some of us to where it led him, but he did, you know, he kept great notes and, and he was very detailed, very detailed. Yeah, and the beautiful thing about it is, is that when you have a basis in accuracy or at least working hard for accuracy, you can navigate the 
things over time in terms of the ideas or the possibilities, you can weigh them, you can include them, you can exclude them, you can test it. And someone who might have a different view, right? And I'm going to mention here the blog post and I, any ongoing discussion. Well, you know, people out there, right? You will get interested in it, right? Maybe there's other people, you know, or, or maybe even the gentleman who was, was interviewed. Obviously, he's going to have just being in that conversation. And I have no idea if he's followed up with Ed. But my point is, is that provides that ongoing conversation so that folks can navigate that. Absolutely. Natasha, obviously, you're familiar with the episode. Um, how, how would you relate it to this conversation today? Uh, I think it just shows the strength of uh, the unfound think tank because uh, together we've been discussing and doing a deep dive of that particular week's case and what was brought out uh, time and time again is that in that particular case uh, the investigator is really just drilling into to his case obviously but we have a wide range to draw from um, yeah. as far as critical thinking and I think it just shows the power of what we're doing here at Unfound and uh, the power of the team, the, the think tank uh, group as well. Absolutely. And by the way, folks, and, and again, folks in our large group, whether it's think tank, everyday listeners, et cetera, whether they're doing blogs or they're just interested on their own, whatever, right? They get interested in it, right? They, they, they ha by, by listening to that program and taking notes, right? They themselves could run with it. There's so much material provided in that episode, right? The, and as Ed said, for an example of properly, notwithstanding disagreements, and let's call them informed disagreements, right? Notwithstanding those informed disagreements, there's a lot of material there that one could go and continue to study. Again, I'll cite the example. I've been open about it. I had never heard of the Nicholas Masucci case before Ed's program on it. Okay. And, and I heard it. I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to run with this on my own. It's trying to stay organized, which doesn't always work for me. Listening closely. What are the things that are known? What are the things that are not known? You could do that with any episode, right? But, but certainly with the, the uh, one we're mentioning here tonight is a tremendous, tremendous episode for, for this and whether one agrees or disagrees with all the conclusions, you can say, wow, right? There's, there's enough credibility there in what was cited and what was, what was done uh, to keep that going. Now, there have been, as you know, some of you know, there's a great, you know, as, as, as always, one of the go-to citation places for, for uh, Unfound is the Charlie Project. And as always, Unfound provides those good uh, references as well as a article from the, um, Oregon Live website about the, particularly about the, uh, the guest, but uh, even on the blog, right, and just in the, in the lead up blog post, um, just some, some material there. And again, even the, um, the excerpt from the private blog, and some of you, of course, may have seen the, the fuller post, but it raises some questions, right? Obviously, we do this because we care about the answers. And, and not because, again, not primarily because of sensationalism, not primarily to make money, not primarily just to be egocentric, but uh, because we care about the truth and we care about, um, you know, getting toward finding what happened to people or if people are still alive, finding them. And so obviously these are going to raise answers and they're going to raise questions. And uh, so I think this is a tremendous example of of that striving for accuracy and even achieving accuracy even if there's still some 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 dis disagreement and again ultimately if you listen to that episode ultimately you are widening your purview to say wow now you're thinking about jolie wefflin deborah swanson Catherine gregory really it's you're dealing with three cases uh you know whether one person was involved in all three but regardless you have three specific cases and as one thing we concur on clearly in this group and beyond is that the missing persons matter, right? And it's back to that awareness raising component for sure. Okay, for sure. So that's also, again, a great for number four, which we're not quite yet to the idea of 
what role does controversy play, right, for sure. I do want to jump now, and if we need it, if we need it, I have another case study. We still have about a half hour, a little over a half hour. Let's get into number three, because this is a big one. We've already sort of hinted at it. Certainly, there's some things mentioned about it on that OWL citation. We all kind of know that the internet has posed a particular problem. Uh, and also, it's helpful, right? The internet, we, we've talked about a number of sources in these episodes, finding people, finding documents. But also, the internet can cause a lot of problems, particularly, though not exclusively, social media. Accuracy is a major issue. Of course, while we're talking about this, we want to continue to think about all media, including outside of the internet, too. But Natasha, I'm going to start with you because, again, this you were one of the ones in our conversations that that kept this on our horizon, my horizon. Okay, so what are some parameters and practices for finding, identifying, and promoting accuracy on the internet, particularly social media? Uh, well, it would definitely be um, something as simple as tagging. So for example, after I create the digital product, which would be the blog, and that includes the video and excerpt from the private blog that can be found on Patreon that uh, Ed writes for each episode. So it's basically this digital package. Then not only do I post it, but if there is a digital presence, uh, either the tag of the guest or and or their Facebook page, then, uh, then I add that as well. So I think that that adds a lot of credibility as opposed to just posting something out there. You know, this is really going to the people that are invested, uh, family members and so on, or they were possibly on the show. Um, but one thing that I think is really kind of an interesting flip to that is that there are guests on Unfound that specifically say that they're not on social media. You know, which brings to question like, okay, is that a wild west out there? There really isn't a moderator uh, for the digital identity of, of the victim. Yeah. So it kind of goes both ways. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Let me just say for myself, um, not that I've been perfect with this over the years, and I'm not just referring to missing persons things, but I am very reflective about what I share anyway in social media. And I'm talking Twitter and Facebook primarily. Um, and, and I'm not, again, not just talking about cold cases, missing persons. Obviously there I'm very careful. Uh, but even other areas of interest, that it is something that is either adequately trying to be accurate or accurate, and again, when you're dealing with accuracy, that could be, you know, things that recognize even unknowns, right? Like, hey, this is something that's still in dispute, which is can be very legitimate. Um, and if it's something that's opinion or analysis, that it's something that um, to some extent, again, we all have different points of view on things that, that I would stand by. And, and, and I always say to people, um, or I often say to people, um, you know, I don't share anything in social media or say anything in social media that I wouldn't stand by offline, right, and, and be able to explain why I did it. And uh, I also sometimes, some of you may notice, I'll put in my social media profiles, uh, the sharing of content doesn't necessarily imply agreement with everything, you know, including ads, because with the internet, you never know what's being shared. And we might share things as resources sometimes like here, but we don't necessarily embrace everything that's there. And I know you could say, boy, you're really overthinking this, but I think this matters. Uh, being very cautious about what we share. And again, I'm not just talking about missing persons, but certainly that matters for missing persons. Tanya, what thoughts would you have about principles and practices, parameters and practices for accuracy on the internet, particularly social media? Um, well, I, if you don't mind, um, I wanted to just mention the Julie Wefflin case real quick. Please. Just something popped up in my, in my head. Um, when you had asked me, I had to think about that for a second. Uh, I knew I had listened to it, but um, I was just thinking that, you know, there was the part of that episode where um, 
it was mentioned that uh, no one had had looked in her locker, I believe, mm-hmm. all these years. So it just it just came to me that um, you know the reporting is sometimes I think only as as good as the the evidence and the in investigations that have already been done too, because there's certain things out there that people don't don't know about yet. And so I just thought of, I uh, just thought all those years, there, there may have been evidence in that locker that could have helped with that. And I don't know, it just, that just stood out to me. Yeah, I that's think. interesting. Um, yeah. And in a sense, that's, that's, that, that leaves questions, right? Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you, and I appreciate that. And there's nothing wrong with jumping back. Let's jump forward. Anything you'd like to add about social media? Um, no, no, nothing that, no, no, thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Kathy, anything about the internet and social media you want to add? Just the obvious the just be careful what you read and discriminate, uh, whether you think that might be accurate or not. There's a lot of inaccuracy, I would say, like on Facebook. And yeah. I'm not on Twitter or any of those, but I'm sure the same thing would apply. Just be very, very careful. Stand back and don't just because 500 people said it means it's true. Just be right. very, I would say, discriminating, discriminate, discriminate. How credible is the person? Is this a person who is an expert? You know, probably not. Yeah. And then if you question something, this is what I do, go and look for other sources on social media or on the internet or whatever to maybe try to verify or disprove something. I think that's what I would add. Yep, that's all very helpful. And you can see how everything we're talking about tonight, whether it's from the audience standpoint, the researcher standpoint, the communicator standpoint, and there's a sort of crossover here how it all matters. Michelle, anything you'd like to add to this? Uh, Definitely verify the source. That's not that. Well, that, and if you don't hear it from the actual person or hear it from the family member, then I wouldn't believe it. But if you just see something that comes up, wait, other things about it, or read other things about it, yes, do some research, Google it. Because a lot of times people just, especially in this culture where we just want to cancel someone right away and just put things out there that are inaccurate and, and people get away with it. You know, it was a time when it had, you, you could get sued. Now it's just, oh, it was in the internet. So it's, it's sort of a freedom thing. So just checking sources, that's what I would say. Very, very good advice. Absolutely. Paula, would you like to add anything to this? No, I think everything's been said. Just verify and A lot of people, though, will just share based on a headline, and you've got to read something before you share it. Yeah. You know, and I know the term is is politicized, and again, notwithstanding your political views, and again, back to my conversation with the team, particularly Natasha, there is a lot of fake news on the internet, particularly social media. Uh, Let's step back from the politicization of that term and just say, yeah, that's a reality for whatever motivations, for whatever reason, some people are just well-meaning, right? They share it because their buddy shared it, who shared it because their buddy shared it, who shared it because their buddy shared it. And as one of you just said, just because it has 500 shares, likes, whatever, retweets, doesn't mean it's true. Doesn't mean it's true. And this theme that we've been talking about tonight, take a step back, get some things in perspective, go use your critical analytical thinking skills, do your extra research. That's all important, especially if you're someone, again, even if it's in your own small sphere, you don't have to have 5 million followers to be influential, right? You may have a small group of people who have serious discussions or read things in a serious way on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and if you're going to have that role, take it responsible, take it in a responsible way. And of course, if you do start to do some blogging or, you know, do whatever way you choose to communicate, I think everyone in this group clearly embraces the notion that there's a sense of responsibility that goes with that. 
Absolutely. One thing I neglected to mention, back to question one also, when we're ascertaining credibility and being credible, right? And again, I'm, it's the issue of disclosure, right? Is if a, a journalist or a broadcaster or commentator, whatever term you want to use, provides adequate disclosure, right? And we know in academic publications, there's ways of dealing with that, you know, journalistic outlets, et cetera, where there's disclosure of things that may raise questions or conflict of interest or just getting it out there. It doesn't necessarily make someone less credible because of that. It, it might mean that you could say, wow, they're, they're more credible because they're putting this out there. Or they're, they're giving some sense of, hey, this situation exists. Again, the only example I'll give now Again, back to, to the Masucci case, listen to that, that episode, Nicholas Masucci. I'm not going to get into every detail here, but you'll hear along the way in that episode that Ed even mentions um, an item that, that, that the case has a, a particular connection to him. But I, we all can cite numerous examples. That's something to look for, right? Is there something... Uh, and I'm not saying always be suspicious all the time, but there is a sense that we have to be on the lookout that journalists, academics, commentators, others give at least that adequate disclosure. And Natasha, you, you know a lot about the, the, that world. And why is that disclosure important for editors and journalists? Well, I just basically picture a funnel and it's, it's actually really simple. So, uh, you know, we talked about the the news outlets the credible news outlets that have been around for hundreds of years like the new york times and the wall street journal then you branch out to the local news which um, hopefully are trying to follow the same standards and then finally you have social media where it's this big pool of everything and people are taking pictures of the latte that they had for breakfast so i mean your discernibility really has to go up when you're on on social uh, but at the same time, everybody's there now. The world is there. And like uh, someone mentioned on, on this meeting, um, sorry, I forgot who it was, but it's, it's very easy to look people up. So if you read a, a good article somewhere, then they usually have a Facebook presence or they have a link to it. And then you see, oh, okay, he's a journalist for uh, the local newspaper in Texas, let's say, or... Uh, even uh, an editor or an op-ed, you can look up the person, see uh, what, other affiliate, uh, what other affiliations they have, if they're members of a board or mm -hmm. uh, CFR, you know, the Council on Foreign Relations or Absolutely, um, I do, yeah. whatever else they're trying to do. That's very helpful. And even the gentleman that was on the, um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the gentleman from, from the Pacific Northwest that was the guest for Ed, of course, it's important to go through his expertise. He had some law enforcement background. He obviously was connected to the workplace. And that's important. That's important in terms of credibility uh, and in terms of credible connections to the case. Of course, again, there are times when someone who can do good work um, and, and as some sort of citizen journalist and may not have expertise or connections in areas, they can still find the truth. But again, at that point, you still kind of see what they're doing. They're, they're, they're showing the work that they're doing. They're providing the evidence and so forth. Uh, very helpful there. And, and I'm sure in future episodes, we are going to continue to be thinking about these things. Uh, controversy is important. It's also problematic. Um, again, with this question, again, my background as a communication person, particularly involved in rhetoric and argumentation, I'm not in this episode getting into a long explanation of dialectic, classically understood rhetoric, inductive logic, deductive logic, right, fallacies, proper, you know, properly grounded inferences, maybe we'll do that in another episode. Um, we know in this group and beyond, unfound. It's our job to uh, enact and reflect argumentation that's ethical and effective. Obviously, Ed and the Unfound team sets a great standard with, with what we do in Unfound, but we know that's not always the case. There is a proper role for controversy. There, obviously, with, with the case we've talked about tonight, that was, that was an example. Um, 
in the Jolie Wefflin case and the guests there. And, but sometimes people, in the, and this goes along with the whole issue of fake news and, and, and accuracy and inaccuracy. And even when people are accurate, they might still be, flim, uh, be thin or style over substance or even sensationalistic how they engage things. Controversy for the sake of controversy, lacking civility, not even then losing sight of, of the facts eventually, even if they start out on solid footing. So for what we're interested in, right, which we care about awareness, we care about accuracy, we want to see these cases solved. What is the role of controversy, Kathy? What role can it play? Uh, go go over that again. I got a little bit interrupted here. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we're thinking about controversy alongside of accuracy. And there's certainly there's a good way to approach it and there's a bad way, right? Sensationalism, like lack of focus, et cetera. And so is there a role for, uh, for controversy in, in missing persons cases? Oh, absolutely. Because facts may be disputed. Uh, you ha again, this kind of goes back to a lot of the things we were talking about, verifying the sources, is this accurate or not? Because if yeah. there's a lot of controversy uh, attached to it, you know, we got to research that and figure out where do we stand on this? How do we want to treat this particular fact or situation or some evidence that was withheld or that should have been disclosed? And again, disclosure is very important. And looking up someone who's giving that information, what is their background? What kind of internet sites do they have, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, controversy is very important, I think. Yeah, and well, you, as Kathy mentions that, it reminded me of something I had on my list. And this, this goes with a number of things we've discussed tonight. And in some way, I'm back to the quotes that I started this with from Ed's April 7th, I believe, blog post, Unfound Weekly blog. And I, and I, and I read the quotes on the front end, and, and that really was trying to get at the issue of, of this time we live in. And, and, and some of this blog post, of course, is, is more about some of Ed's personal and professional standpoint, some relevant, some indirectly relevant. But it does. I would encourage you to read that because it, it, I think it raises some things that not just personally, but professionally, the sorts of things that, that one would think about in terms of, you know, not just Ed, not just Unfound, but in general, what sorts of standards are being set out there. Obviously, people have to navigate their own boundaries, but uh, that reminded me of that for sure. So thank you, Kathy. It reminded me of something I had on my list but didn't get to. Um, let's go to Tanya. Tanya, what role does controversy have? And I can come back to you, Tanya, if we need to. Paula, how about you? What role does controversy have? Well, I think anytime there's controversy, you've got people talking and having more conversation, whether it's no, that's not accurate. This is what the report said or whatever. But anytime you can keep a case in conversation, I mean, unless it's just pointless conversation. Yep. But if you can keep those ideas out there, you know, just, it just helps keep the case. And the more people think about it, you know, they think about things that they never saw that way, much like the think, the think tank. I mean, we, I listen to the episodes differently now, probably a little more critically than I did before the think tank. So even with controversy can come continued conversation and hopefully some resolution. This is so important. Back to the, toward the beginning of this episode when Natasha and I had that very helpful exchange. There is no question that if we're interested in raising awareness about cases and we are and we care about accuracy we have to take seriously the notion that we do want to in an ethical and effective way to use the popular term create a buzz we just don't want the buzz to be uh, 
thin, superficial, sensationalistic. Uh, one of the things I noted tonight is how leadership is important for prioritizing accuracy and navigating controversy. We need people to lead. Now, people can lead in their own ways. We all can lead in some way, right? Uh, but you, you, and you need people to, to be committed to that, to keep that conversation going in a helpful way. So that's a very important point. And controversy, properly engaged, can help with that. Tanya, I'm coming back to you. Did we miss you before, or are you, is there any, you want to pass on this one? I'm going I'm to pass. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Michelle, do you want to say anything about controversy? Okay, I'm going to assume you're passing, Michelle, and that's okay. Okay, okay, and let's go to Natasha. Natasha, you want to say anything about controversy? Oh, yeah, definitely. So controversy is something that can be easily uh, rounded up, especially on social media. So one would have to ask, why is there controversy to begin with? Who's benefiting? Who's not? And then something that my anthropology professor um, taught us that I think about quite often is uh, pay attention to what is said and also to what is not said, because what is not said can be even more important. So try to uh, garner an idea or a concept as to why the controversy exists, but not to pay so much attention to it that uh, you really should be paying attention to something else, but you're not because of all the controversy. Natasha, that's really interesting. And of course, someone myself who comes from a rhetoric, rhetorical studies background, obviously, if I'm going to engage in rhetorical criticism of a particular controversy, there are things, there are patterns, there are questions uh, lines of analysis that one might look for. Well, we could do a whole episode on this and maybe we will. Again, back to dialectic and rhetoric and induction and deduction and fallacy, avoiding fallacies and, and making well-grounded inferences. Uh, that's very helpful. I do want to mention, did anything else have anything want to say on this? Because I'm going to go to sort of a, a controversy that I think all of you are aware of. Okay, this was another one that um, we we talked about in our in our team discussions, and and of course Ed mentioned. I'm not gonna again. We're not here to adjudicate this tonight. I'm mentioning it by means of example. So my purpose is to to show um, again uh, how controversy can go, uh, how controversy can be helpful. And in some ways, I guess some would argue how controversy can go off the rails. And so, of course, I'm talking about the um, Thomas Brown case. Again, we're not here to adjudicate this tonight. Um, this was a case, obviously, and um, as reported out there in more than one case, you know, ABC7 Amarillo, right? This was something where, where there was a meetup, right? And this was studied intensely. And this, if you go to, and I know some of you are very familiar with this, um, back to the se September 2019 newsletter, the October 2019 Unfound newsletter, and then some later discussion on a live, Unfound Live. Um, my interest in this tonight is that as I was just going back, and I'll be honest with you, when that was happening, I didn't keep up much. But I was trying to uh, gather some insights for accuracy and uh, properly dealing with controversy in some of the commentary on the case and discussion from Ed. And um, I'm look, I, I read through some of the blog posts and, and thought through this. And, you know, I, you know, certainly my understanding is, is this is a, a topic that's, that's not being revisited now 
within uh, unfound circles. And so with regard to the sheriff and so forth. But I want to mention there's some things, particularly in the, in the September blog post that I found helpful. And, um, you know, and I, and I was thinking about the Weffling case too, and, and obviously some other cases, not even just unfound. How we grapple with circumstantial evidence, for instance, right? And, and, and uh, obviously circumstantial evidence is, is, is evidence, but as Ed says here, it's not hard evidence, right? It, it points us in a direction. It provides layers. It gives us things to argue about. It raises questions. But it also has to, we have to be blunt when we're, when we're doing research. It's, it, it gives us insights, but it may not be what we think it is. And obviously this has come up tonight. Uh, the key of investigation, right? This is something that we have talked about so many times, right? When we're, whether you wanna use the term theorizing, hypothesizing, whatever, right? We have to have some basis in fact or reasonable inference to keep moving forward, right? Investigation, right? Theories never substitute for investigation. And I'm quoting Ed here. So, you know, as, as we shift in that spectrum, you know, when we're, when we're having it, when we're making, really we should be aiming for good analysis, right? Because good analysis is gonna be grounded in the facts that we know and sort of thinking through the reasonable inferential leaps, avoiding rumors, unfounded conjecture, et cetera, right? That's something to think about. Uh, be cautious for conspiracies. Of course, there are times in life and in history when people do conspire, but if you're going to make that claim, you better have some pathway of evidence to, to substantiate that claim, right? People are motivated in different ways for different reasons to do different things. So. Yeah, that's something to think about. I could go on and on here, okay? I'm gonna get some quick thoughts here. We still have a little bit of time. Uh, Natasha, obviously this is a known controversy. Again, we're not here to adjudicate this tonight, but as an example of what to do and what not to do in controversy, any thoughts about the Brown case? Not only the Brown case, but about uh, other cases as well. I think let's say the main protagonist, let's say if it's the mother, you know, always out there on interviews in any type of outreach, journalistic outreach, I yeah. think it, they should at least be introduced if yeah. not uh, covered, you know, just to have some kind of a statement because not to do so personally, I think is insulting. Fair point to consider, fair point to consider. Tanya, anything you'd like to mention is the Brown case as an example. Again, we're not here to adjudicate it tonight. Tanya, I'll take that as a pass. Kathy, anything you'd like? Oh, Tanya, okay, your mic's open. Tanya, you first. Is there something you wanted to say? Okay. Kathy, we're coming to you. Anything you'd like to say on the Brown case as an example? Again, we're not adjudicating it, Kathy. Again, I'm not a much of an expert on this case since I live in California. Never heard of it until uh, I joined Unfound. So, um, and I have a sister who lives in Dallas. She had never heard of it until it was on ID here recently. So not, I'm gonna just say cases in general that I learned this in my job. You have to look with circumstantial evidence, you have to look at um, the big picture. Don't just take little pieces and put them all together. Yeah. They have, you have to take way in mind this big picture, does this fit? So I, someone said, maybe it was Natasha, saying something about how a piece of uh, circumstantial evidence can mean something this way, but if you look at it another way, it can mean something else. So putting these things, the way you put them together, be careful because there can be more than one opinion. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Tanya, did you have anything or is that a pass? 
Okay, Paula, how about you? Paula, is there something you wanted? Again, we're using this case as an example. We're not adjudicating it tonight. Anything you'd like to mention? Um, just the, I mean, at some point, I mean, I think controversy and looking at things from another person's perspective and listening to their ideas is helpful. Um, I think specifically the Tom Brown case was just out of control, like the comments. Yeah. Um, anytime a link, I learned quickly that anytime a link was shared on the unfound page, I read the article, but just avoided the comments on that wow. particular case. So as much as it brings conversation, you know, I don't know if it's worse in a small town, if it's the, I, I don't know, but I'm not so sure the comments on there were constructive enough. I don't, I don't, I think there's a fine line between controversy sparking conversation and perhaps understanding and then it being totally ineffective. Ineffective, sorry. Yeah, and, and you raise, I mean, and you point to this discussion tonight, social media, even in very well-managed frameworks like unfound pages or elsewhere you have to sort through obviously ed and the team do their best to regulate and navigate not to the point of of not having some sense of open discussion but you know it's the unfound platform and there's a responsibility to make things are being done according to the unfound brand so that's important um, Michelle, anything you'd like to add about this case as an example, not we're not adjudic adjudicating it tonight. Okay, I'll take that as a pass, Michelle. I know there was some delay here, so I just want to give you a moment. Okay. We have just a few minutes, folks. Um, this was a tremendous conversation tonight. And of course, as always, I and Ed and or the team will be in touch soon about our next episode at some point in the future. Uh, the audio of this episode uh, will be provided. We, will, we are continuously updating, continually in an ongoing way, updating the Data Gems page. I wanna thank everyone for participating tonight. Uh, in the unfound on the ground number five episode, which of course was entitled or is entitled prioritizing accuracy and navigating controversy for missing persons cases. I want everyone to be safe out there. And as always for any of these cases, whether they're missing persons cases, cold cases, crime in general, someone out there knows something or knows someone know something. Be safe out there, folks. Thank you. Have a great week.